Hi, my name's Paul Grogan and welcome to my Games of the Month video log for August 2023. As always, I will be talking about all of the games that I've been playing, giving you an update on what's coming new to the channel over the next few weeks, uh, and a personal update as well. Now, before we start, I always like to start with a few extra bits of information. And the first bit of information I wanted to say today is if you notice that during this video I appear to be in agony, um, then that might be because I am. I've pulled a muscle about eight days ago, uh, sort of in my neck and all the way down to my arm, uh, and I've been in pretty intense pain for the last eight days not sleeping well, uh, having some sort of, uh, having some physio for it and everything else. It's just, I, I don't exactly know what caused it, but when you start to get a bit older, things stop working as well as they did and the body isn't able to take as much as it could. And all it takes for me is sitting hunched over for a few hours or sleeping with my head at a funny angle. Anyway, this has been really bad. So um, yeah, there you go. In, in Just in advance, if I wince in pain, it's not because I didn't like the game that I'm talking about. It's just because I'm having a twinge from my... Wait, it's right now it's gone up to my shoulder. It's sort of in my shoulder and above my arm. Anyway, hopefully it will go away soon. So let's start by talking about all of the games that I've been playing since the last video log. So this is a period of time from August the 1st right through to yesterday, because I'm not going to talk about the game that I'm playing tonight. I'm actually recording this video on a Tuesday. What day is it? The 29th of August. Uh, I do have a game plan for tonight and a game plan for tomorrow, but I will leave them and talk about them in the next video log. So to kick things off, just before the wedding, which we'll talk about later on, I did a couple of games of Castles of Burgundy with the new special deluxe edition uh, solo playthroughs. These are on the channel now. Well, one of them is I basically did a solo playthrough in the afternoon to learn the game and then a solo playthrough in the evening, which was a public playthrough. So that's on the channel if you're interested in that. Now, if you already know Castles of Burgundy, you might want to watch the video for two reasons. First of all, I'm showing off the new special edition from Awaken Realms. So thank you very much to Awaken Realms for sending me that copy of the game. But also I use the Vineyards expansion. So the Vineyards expansion is a new expansion uh, that comes with this special edition. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was already there uh, beforehand in one of the previous expansions. I'm not 100% sure about that because I kind of lost track of all of the le the little mini expansions that came out for this game. I've played the base game about 300 or so times, um, mostly online, but yeah, never played with any of the expansions. Castles of Burgundy is one of my favourite games. I don't know where exactly it sits in my top games of all time, and it isn't actually my favourite Stefan Feld game. Trajan is my favourite Stefan Feld game, but it's definitely up there in the top four or five Stefan Feld games for me. Although most people you speak to when you say what's your favourite Stefan Feld game, Castles of Burgundy is the one that they uh, that they say. And it surprised me when Awaken Realms were doing a version of Castles of Burgundy. Because let's face it, Castles of Burgundy is one of the driest, boring Euros out there. I mean, I love the game, but there's no theme in it whatsoever. And it is just a mechanical game. It's an extremely good game. But for the kind of games that Awaken Realms normally do, which are very miniature heavy, narrative driven, in-depth story games. Castles of Burgundy is like, when when it was announced that they were going to be doing a new version, I thought it was an April Fool's joke. I really, really did. Um, but they've done a really good job with it. And it, the miniatures in it do look nice. And it's actually nice to see Awaken Realms branching out from the style of games that they normally do to cover something a bit different. Anyway, what did I think about the game? Well, Castles of Burgundy, I absolutely love the game. No question about what that whatsoever. The Vineyards expansion, I, I did enjoy. I thought the Vineyards expansion was, was a really good addition to the game. I probably wouldn't use it with new players, but I would probably want to use it uh, if people have played the game before. It just added an extra dimension to the game and gave you other directions to go in and something else to do. So yeah, if you're interested in that, as I say, it is on the channel. Now, skipping ahead, I did uh, I did multiplayer playthrough as well. So if you're interested in that, I did a three player playthrough, or maybe it was four, I can't quite remember, but that's on the channel as now uh, as well, if you want to see that. Uh, those were sponsored videos from Awaken Realms, but when I was in discussion with them, it's like, you know, it, and this is the weird thing with my job. It's a sponsored video. So they commissioned me to make those videos. I got paid to make those videos and I did a good job, I think. And, you know, I learned the game properly and I tried to show the game off in, in a good light. But when, when I end up doing a commissioned video or a sponsored video for a game which I absolutely love, 
it doesn't feel like work half the time. And that's that's the benefits of this job sometimes is that when I'm covering a game that I really enjoy, um, it's, yeah, it's quite nice. Anyway, that is Castles of Burgundy. So solo playthrough and a multiplayer playthrough on the channel now, if you're interested in seeing that. Next up, and yeah, we're going to talk about the wedding later on in the video, but on the day of the wedding, which was the 4th of August, I did play a game. Although I'm not sure you could class it as a game. So a very good friend of mine, Mark, insisted that I play a game with him on my wedding day. And there's very little time. If you've ever got married, you will know that there's not much time apart from socialising and talking to guests and things like that. It's a very full on day and there's a, there's a lot happening, um, aside from the fact that you're actually getting married and, and things like that. But we did take a few board games with us uh, to the wedding for people in the afternoon, for the afternoon guests to play them. So there was So Clover, Just One, Perudo, things like that. But Mark brought with him Win, Lose or Banana. And although most of this video log is going to be very positive about the games that I've played, <laughs> Mark ruined my wedding day. No, I'm only joking. Um, but yeah, what I mean, for those people who know what Win, Lose or Banana is, and for those people who know the kind of games that I like, you will know that Win, Lose or Banana for me is a one out of 10 game. It's not really even a game. Um, and basically it's a three player game and Mark had the three cards, he shuffled them, he dealt them out, and he said, right, who's got the banana? And I was like, well, I have the banana. And he said, right, so you've got to pick either me or Matt, uh, and one of us has got the win card, and one of us has got the lose card. And if you pick the win card, you win, and if you pick the lose card, you lose. That's the game. Now, that kind of game appeals to a certain type of people, uh, and I know those people will enjoy that game, because it's all about just having fun, it's bluffing, and Mark spent a good two minutes persuading me to take his card, because he had the win card, allegedly. Uh, and I was like, I don't believe anything Mark ever says, so I'm going to pick Matt. So I picked Matt, and it turns out Mark wasn't lying, and he had the win card. And that was it. So we played win, lose, win, lose or banana, and I lost. I got the banana, and I lost. Anyway, I've logged it on Board Game Geek as a game that I played. I will hopefully never play it again, but... As I say, it's one of those games which is definitely out there for people who like that kind of thing, which which isn't me. Uh, next up, I've logged this on my list, but to be honest, we actually played this over about five or six sessions, split up over about four or five weeks. And this is Cantaloupe, book one, which is Breaking into Prison. So me and Vicky played this together. We absolutely love uh, puzzle games, adventure games, and we both like the point and click style computer games. And Cantaloupe is basically a point and click adventure game done in a, mm, well, it's a board game. It's not really a board game, but it's done in in a physical game format. And we've played a lot of games. We've played uh, Time Stories. We've played the Exit games. We've played the Unlock games. We've played lots of different styles of these type of games. Cantaloupe is probably one of my favourite ones. It is the one which felt most like a point and click adventure than anything else, with the upsides of that and the downsides of that. The upsides of it is it's great, it's an adventure, and you have to really think about things and oh, we have to combine that with that, and it makes this, and then we have to speak to that person, and then that person goes out to mop up the floor, and then while they're gone, we can do this. Yeah, really, really felt like that. The downside is some of the things, like in the old style computer games, you need to combine the, the orange frog with the sellotape. Well, why? Why, why? why would you do that? But, oh, you do, and suddenly you've got orange frog attached to sellotape, and you're like, oh, yeah, right, okay. Now, it was less obscure than that. Most of the puzzles, most of the things um, were relatively logical when you thought about them. The best thing about it is the hint system. The hint system is really well done. So whenever you get stuck, and we did get stuck a few times in it, uh, you can look through the hints at the back and it says, have you marked this? Yes. Have you marked this? Yes. Have you marked this? No. Ah. And it kind of knows where you are in the story, even though it's sort of non-linear um, and it gives you hints to be able to do those certain things. So yeah, really enjoyed it. We do have the other two up on the shelf there uh, and we're looking forward to playing those. Although I have heard Cantaloupe Book 2 uh, people have various issues with it because there's apparently a hacking mini game in it that a lot of people didn't like. 
Um, but we're, we're aware of that, so we'll, we'll see how we get on with the other ones. Anyway, that is Cantaloupe Book One. Uh, next up, the week after the wedding, uh, the designer of a game called Midhalla played Midhalla with me. This was a live stream, which is... Uh, well, okay, the video is on the channel now, but it didn't actually go out as a live stream. It was recorded as if it was a live stream, but then it was edited later and it was uploaded. Midhalla is on Kickstarter right now. If you're interested in Midhalla and you're watching this video, it is a cross between... It's sort of like a Viking-themed game. It's got narrative... It has a dungeon exploration and it has combat in it, but the combat is deterministic. And it's very much like a puzzle game. And the designer, when they contacted me about it, they thought I would like the combat in it because it reminded them, or they thought it would remind me a bit of Mage Knight, uh, which is my number one favorite game, in the way that the, the combat is like, right, okay, well, we need to, that one's gonna move there, then it's gonna get hit by the trap, it's gonna take three damage, but then it's going to have one left. So if we do that, and yeah, that's the style of the combat in the game. But woven together with a story, a narrative, and, and everything else. If you're interested in the game, check out my video. It's on the channel now. It's mid -Halla. We played through chapter three. Now, we played through the entire chapter in the video. So the video was about two and a half or three hours long. But to be honest, you don't have to watch that whole thing. What I would recommend is if you're interested in the game watching the part where we get to the first battle and then watching the first battle and that gives you a good idea about the game you don't need to watch the rest of the video to have an idea of how it plays out but if you want to it is there chapter three contained three battles so basically it was exploration story then there was a battle then there was a bit more exploration a bit more story then another battle uh, and then a bit more and then there was a third and final battle and then that was pretty much the end of the chapter um, but things evolve over the course of the chapter. Uh, you get better equipment, your characters level up and things like that. And although it is a campaign style game, it's interesting in that your character actually kind of resets at the at the start of the next chapter um, because you gain skills and things like that over the course of the, of the chapter. But then you lose all of that at the end, which might not sound like a great thing, but actually in terms of the game, it, it works well um, because a single chapter has you playing and developing your character and it means you can experiment with different skill loadouts each time you play. Um, so yeah, really enjoyed that. The Kickstarter is, is still live, it's funded, it's, it's done quite well. So very happy for uh, for the designer of that one and yeah, look forward to seeing that one when it's when it's actually finished. Next one up, we did uh, Aeon Trespass Odyssey. So this is, this is gonna be my, my 10 minute section where I talk about Aeon Trespass Odyssey because we've played it four times in August. Uh, it was supposed to be five, but unfortunately I had to cancel one of them because everything was getting on top of me the week before the wedding and I was running out of time. And I think I was ill again. Um, but we, yeah, we, I've got four logged plays for it in August and we're due to play it again tonight. So I spoke about this quite a lot in the last video log. So I'm gonna try and not cover the same things again, but this is a game that I have now played more this year than most other games that I've got. And we will be continuing to play this on a weekly basis until we finish cycle one and then maybe beyond. Um, Aeon Trespass Odyssey is an epic, massive scope campaign game. One to four players uh, set in a sort of ancient Greek alternative history. Um, but the game boasts 500 hours of gameplay. Now we're playing cycle one we are pro we're on day 19 out of a maximum of 80. So assuming we succeed and assuming we don't die and have to play the, the, the cycle again, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But assuming we succeed at our current rate of progress, we are we are like nine sessions in, probably three hours a session. So we're probably about 25, 30 hours into the game and we are about a quarter of the way through. So it's probably about right. But it, it really, it's really weird because you can end up in one game session spending an hour covering five days of game time. Or you might spend two entire game sessions covering one day of game time. And that's where we've been at the moment because it's split up. It's, it has these battles now and again, and each battle is going to take you a couple of hours to resolve. We ended up in one situation where we had a battle followed by another battle and then the next day another battle. So in a three week period, in terms of real time, we covered one day of game time. So 
yeah, I reckon we've probably got about 120 to 150 hours of gameplay in cycle one. And yeah, we're, we're, we're nine sessions in. We've got session 10 tonight. Um, loving it. Absolutely loving it. But the game does come with... Um, well, not the game does come with it, but before you rush off and everybody goes, oh, well, Paul loves the game, so we definitely must need to get this. Remember, I like a lot of different styles of games. And there are two games that I have been playing a lot of recently, which is Voidfall and Aeon Trespass Odyssey. Now, I'm going to talk about Voidfall in a little bit, but ultimately, Voidfall is a super heavy Euro game that is very, very much a Euro game with non-dice combat, it is totally deterministic combat. And then on the other end of the scale, you have Aeon Trespass Odyssey, which is, it's not roll for movement, and it is an extremely tactical game. It is extremely complex, uh, it's extremely detailed, and the combat gives so many options for tactical plays and everything else, but ultimately, you're rolling dice to see whether you hit something. You're then rolling dice to see whether you wound it. And there is a lot of other very swingy card draws from decks. Uh, massively swingy card draws from decks. If that's not your thing, and that's not normally my thing either, but in this game, we are absolutely drawn to the experience of playing it, the narrative, the sheer amount of detail uh, and in, in, in the stories and the adventures. The battles are difficult and we are playing the battles but to be honest it's the it's the narrative it's the adventure it's the story it's the unlocking secret stuff it's that whole experience that is the thing that i want out of the game so what's happened in the last few weeks is without giving any spoilers away i can't say anything i can't i can't really talk about what's happened in the game apart from yeah without giving any spoilers away we have just continued to play. We've continued to explore. Uh, we've completed, I, I can't even remember where we got to last time, but we've completed story 1A and we've completed story 2A, for those people who know what that is. Um, and we're, we're, we're exploring, we're progressing, we're having more battles. We fought the Pursuer once, that didn't go well. Um, but one thing I do want to mention is what happened last time. So in our previous session uh, of Aeon Trespass Odyssey, it was a really, really tricky situation because you have these titans on board your ship and it's the titans that you use to fight the primordials. And every time you go into a battle, you fight with four titans. If you have four titans, if you don't have four titans, then you go into a battle with what you have. But trust me, the game is so difficult and so tight. If you go into a battle with fewer than four titans, I, I can't see how you could ever win. Um, if you're watching this video and you've played Aeon, Aeon Trespass Odyssey and you have got into a battle with fewer than four titans in one, let me know because that does deserve an achievement. Anyway, we were on five titans. We were about to have one of our toughest fights yet, a level two Hecaton. We've never fought anything other than level one. So we're fighting Hecaton at level two. Now we fought Hecaton a few times. We know its cards. We know its strategies. We know what it does. We've also, although the level of the monster has increased, we've been crafting better gear, we've been crafting better items, things with reflex, um, which allows us to move out of the way so we can avoid the knockback. I've been reading strategy articles, I've been watching other videos. We've been putting in the effort to try and become better at this game in terms of our uh, tactical decisions that we're making. And we really thought about where we're going to move to. Oh, well, the, the monsters, we think it's going to do that. So if we move to here, that means that if it knocks us back, we won't get hit. We were really thinking quite hard about it. We were putting in effort before the session and during the session to try and make sure that we didn't make any misplays. Now, we did make some misplays. And thank you very much to the couple of people who watched that video back afterwards, because these are live streamed, but only to patron supporters. Um, because we're filming them round at Rick and Victoria's house with a webcam sat on top of a TV. The, the quality of the videos is not such that I would want it on the public channel, but it's there for patron supporters who want to, want to watch along with it. I did send the video to a couple of people on the Discord channel and they watched it through and they said, right, you made a big tactical mistake here. You should have moved here before attacking because the chances are you were going to get put back. Thank you very much for that. That's the level of detail that I needed in order to get better at the game. But anyway, 
That aside, we just got massively unlucky again. We There were a few situations which could have gone either way. And unfortunately, all of them went against us. So, and this is this is where I come back to what I said about the swinginess of the card draw. When you get damaged in this game, you draw a card from a trauma deck. Some of those cards are good, some of them are bad. Literally one of them will say, you die. And a, and, and a card from the exact same deck might say, oh, succeed, um, heroic strength, get a bonus attack, do this, do that, flip over, make a cup of tea... And all, you know, massive bonuses. And you're like, now what this leads to is really exciting and tense combats because you don't know, everything's on a knife edge. You don't know what's going to happen. The downside is sometimes when things just slip away from you, you just end up in this uh, continuing uh, escalation of, of despair. Um, and looking back at that playthrough that we did and the couple of people that watched it back afterwards said, you actually did get close to winning this. The, the, you know, if, if a few of those things had have gone for you, you might have won this battle with no casualties. As it was, we lost the battle and we all got completely wiped out. Now, there is a way you can retreat in this game. And this particular fight, we could have retreated after we'd taken two casualties. But the problem then is that we take the two casualties we're down to three titans. We don't get any rewards for succeeding. We get some resources, but we don't get any rewards. Um, and we, now, we, we then only have three titans and suddenly we're down, ready to go into the next fight. Now, there is going to be five days before the next fight, but we didn't want to. We didn't want to retreat. The good thing about the game is it comes with this special divine resource called the Sisyphus Tear. We have two of them. And at the end of a battle, if it didn't go your way, you can use a Sisyphus Tear to rewind time and replay the battle again. That's what we're doing tonight. So basically we used one of our Sisyphus tears, that battle gone, completely written off, and we're gonna replay it tonight. Now, the next big thing we need to decide is whether we want to tweak the rules of the game because this game, this game is hard, right? Now, I don't mind hard games, but what I don't want to do is I don't want to spend my next few months not enjoying the game as much as I could do because it is just too hard. I mean, ultimately, this is just one game that I'm playing out of many. I'd love this to be the game which I play three times a week and I become an absolute expert at. But the reality is I'm playing so many different games and I am working on so many different games that I have to be an expert in terms of the rules of all of these games that I'm working on, my brain simply cannot hold. I, I, I don't think I have the capability of becoming a tactical genius at this game. That Certain people do, and that's great. That's not me. And the difficult decision we have is, if we continue to play the game with the level of difficulty that it is, is it actually going to be uh, hindering our enjoyment of the game because we're just not progressing and we're not getting anywhere. Thankfully, there are easy tweaks that you can make to the game to make it easier. And this has been talked about on the various forums and BGG and everything else. And the designer himself, Marcin, has said, one change that you can make to the game, if you want to, is just add plus one to all your die rolls. Every time you're doing an attack roll or an invasion roll, uh, just add one. That won't break the game at all it will just make it easier for you. And I'm going to have a discussion with the other players uh, tonight to see if we want to do that. I don't want to do that. I'd love to be able to play the game as it's intended. But also, I don't want this... We put all of this effort in and then we get a TPK and we wipe out. So I think... And I'm, I'm going to say we do this for tonight. We add plus one to all of our dice rolls because ultimately... If we end up doing a few fights and suddenly we go, oh, this is actually a bit easy now. We've got better at the game. We've got better gear. And suddenly these fights are not a challenge whatsoever. I don't think we'll ever be in that situation. We could easily reverse that decision. Anyway, if you're an Aeon Trespass Odyssey player and you know what I've been talking about, let me know what you think about it. And if you are playing the game, let me know where you've got to with it. Next up, Voidfall. 
the other game that I said I was going to mention because I've been playing a lot of. So I've done, uh, in the last few weeks, I've done a three-player live playthrough of Voidfall. That is on the channel now. I have done a solo playthrough with Mark Dainty. That's on the channel now. And also, the How to Play video for Voidfall went live at the start of this month. So in terms of Voidfall, I've got you covered. I've done the, the full How to Play video, which is one hour and two minutes long. I know it's a complex game. Is rated weight 4.7 on BGG, which is a rating I actually I actually agree with. It is a very complex game. It is extremely intuitive, and the graphic design is a work of art and genius. Um, but it is a complex game with a lot going on. So, Voidfall How to Play video is on the channel now if you want to see it. Then, if you want to see a full three-player playthrough, that's on the channel as well. Um, and then I covered the solo game. So me and Mark Dainty got together and we played the solo game together. We were playing it together as if we were one. We were talking about our decisions. We were going through the process of what we should do and things like that. Uh, yeah, so Voidfall, I talked about this a lot in my last video log uh, about how it is my current game of the year. It is a top five game for me of all time. Absolutely love the game, but you couldn't get much different from A.M. Trespass Odyssey if you tried. Voidfall is not a campaign game. Okay, the weight is the same. It, 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 they've both probably got the same weight rating, although I'd probably put A.M. Trespass Odyssey more complex because it has a lot more uh, fiddly rules in it, uh, whereas Voidfall is streamlined. <laughs> <laughs> for a super heavy Euro game. Um, but yeah, Voidfall is not a campaign game. It is a game with multiple scenarios, but you just pick a scenario, you play it, it's done. It's completely deterministic combat, whereas Aeon Trespass Odyssey is lots of dice rolling. And I love both of them. So that's what I'm saying is, for those people who are influenced by the things that I say and the, the ratings that I give on games, I don't know, it, it makes me a little uncomfortable being an influencer, I don't like that term, but technically I am because people have made decisions based on what I've said. And what I will always say is don't just listen to whether I like the game or not, listen to the reasons why I'm liking the game. Because there are certain people watching this video right now who will absolutely hate Voidfall. And there are other people watching this video who will absolutely hate Aeon Trespass Odyssey. And yet I love both of them. So yeah, take everything I say, not with a pinch of salt, just bearing in mind my personal thoughts and my opinions. Next up, Secret Identity times three. Okay, well, let's talk about it now. I can't remember exactly when I played it, but I think it was one night when people came round on a Friday night and we had about, I think it was, it might have even been after the Voidfall game. No, it wasn't. It was after the Castles of Burgundy game. That was it. It was after the Castles of Burgundy game We'd finished by about 9.30 or something like that. So I said, look, who wants to stick around? And we'll, we'll play some more games. Um, and a few people said, yeah, 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 we'll stick around. So I went into the other room and I dug out a game on the shelf called Secret Identity. Now, Secret Identity was actually sent to me from Hachette Board Games UK. Thank you very much, Flavian. He sent it to me last November, just in advance of GridCon 3. GridCon is a convention which me and Vicky run together. It happens every November. Uh, and Flavian sent me a couple of games before GridCon 3, and one of them was Secret Identity. And he said, it's a party game for gamers. So I put it in the library, and it got borrowed, and it got played, and the people who played it said it was good, and it's been sat on my shelf there for the last, what, nine, ten months? And eventually I went, oh, hang on a minute, now might be the time to play Secret Identity. And then I've played it another two times this month. I was not expecting to like this game as much as I did. This is a game for up to eight players, and it plays better with more people, where each round, eight names get dealt out at random. And these names are everything from Snoop Doggy Dog to um, Tucker Carlson, Cinderella, The Hulk... Yeah, it, it's a real mixture of real and non-real people. Um, and each player will get assigned one of those at random. So you know which one you've got, but you don't know which ones the other players have got. And then what you've got is you've got these 10 Picto cards. These Picto cards, I'll put a picture of them on screen now. These Picto cards are basically, they've got two pictures on the front and two pictures on the back. So you've got 10 of these cards 
but the game lasts for four rounds. And if you use a card, it's gone. So you've only got 10 cards for the whole four rounds. And basically what you do is you slot one, two or three of these cards into your player board to describe the person that you've been dealt at random. But the clever bit is you've got the green dots and you've got the red dots. And if you slot the card in the side with the green dots, you are saying that that icon represents that person. If you slot them into the side with the red slot, uh, with the red light, you are saying that this icon does not represent this person. And what this game does is it really allows for a lot of creativity and cleverness with the, with the puzzles. And that's what I like about it. Essentially, what then happens is once everybody's done that, you go around the table and you have to try and guess what other people have done. And it works a little bit like pictures if you've played pictures. For everybody who guesses yours correctly, you get one point and they get one point each. So it's a competitive game. You are trying to get the most points, but you get points for guessing other people's correctly and you get points for everybody who guesses yours correctly. Then next round, you replace the eight names with eight new names. You go again but the 10 Picto cards, they don't get replaced or replenished. So whichever ones of those you used get discarded. If it sounds like silly nonsense, it, it's not. I don't play silly nonsense party games. I play party games that are good and work as party games. So I played just one. I play So Clover and I play this one again. This one was really good fun and it worked really well. And I love the fact that you can be very creative with the, well, this person is not this and it just yeah really really good anyway that is secret identity next up <clears throat> i played ascendancy for the second time so ascendancy is another game which is on kickstarter right now and i did a live playthrough of this game uh with andy and adrian from the who's turn it's anyway podcast the game is on kickstarter right now if you're interested in it it advertises itself as the ultimate forex worker placement game and Matthew, the designer of the game, he joined us for that live playthrough um, because I wanted a safety net there to make sure we got the rules correct. And I wasn't I wasn't very comfortable before going into the game with the rules of the game. So I asked Matthew to be there to help us during the game with any rules questions we had. As it turns out, 90% of it we were okay with, but it was good that Matthew was there anyway to jo join in and help out and things like that. It's on the channel now if you're interested in watching it. Uh, it was my second game of it. We did play a learning game of it uh, a week or two before. Um, and it's it's another one, a bit like Midhalla, first time designer, gone on Kickstarter with this game that he's been working on for years and years. I'm happy to say it's funded and it, and it appears to be doing very well. And you can clearly see the amount of time and effort that the designer has put into this game. It does have a little bit of a kitchen sink approach to it, but not in a bad way. There's a lot going on in this game and Matthew has tried to put so many elements from so many different games in there that he likes to create a kind of 4X experience with a lot of influence from a lot of games from the 90s. So you've got the, uh, but you've got worker placement as well. You've got worker placement part, you've got exploring the board, uh, you've got combat, you've got these technologies, you've got introduction of champions, you're going on quests, You've got these magic eyes. You've got all sorts of stuff going on. And when I first played it, I was thinking this was going to be overwhelming and there was going to be too much going on. But actually, once you get into the flow of it, it actually flows quite well. So really pleased that he's had a success with it on Kickstarter. If you're interested in it, check out the campaign now. And if you're interested in our three player playthrough, that is on the channel if you, if you want to watch that. Next up, we played a game called The Warp. Now, I'll be honest with you, the designer of the Warp, a guy called Thomas, contacted me a number of months ago and said, Hi Paul, I'm the designer of a game called The Warp. It was successfully funded on Kickstarter a while back, uh, and I was wondering if you would be interested in covering it on the channel. I, I hadn't heard of the game beforehand. Uh, it is a space-themed 4X game. Well, it's a sci-fi themed. The game doesn't actually take place in space. It takes place on a planet. But what I did with a... With light, I get a lot of these emails and quite a lot of the time I speak to my patron supporters. So on, on the Slack channel that we have for patron supporters, I posted on there a couple of months ago and I said, look, the designer of this game is called The Warp has contacted me uh, and asked me if I'd be interested in covering the game on the channel. 
Does anybody know anything about this game? Do you think I would like it? Do you think it would be a fit for the channel? And a few of my supporters who had actually backed the game and some of them who hadn't backed the game came back to me and said, yes, the game is really good. You definitely should consider co covering it on the channel because I think you'll enjoy it. And even the people who didn't back it looked into it and said, yeah, this game does look good. So I agreed to cover it on the channel and, and I did. Uh, and that is on the channel now. And I have to say that they were right. We really enjoyed it. So I learned the game on the Thursday. The designer of the game uh, spent the afternoon with me teaching me how to play the game. I then took it to the games club on the Thursday evening. I played it with two people at the games club. They both loved it. Uh, I then had friends round on the Friday afternoon. We played it. They loved it. We then played it on Friday night, which was the live stream, which is on the channel now, if you're interested in it. And they loved it as well. So it's not just that I enjoyed the game. It's the fact that everybody who played it enjoyed the game. And we played a three player game of it. This game is for two to six players. Now, the, the, the five to six player game is an expansion. The base game is only for one to four players. But yeah, we just really enjoyed this game. It is, you have control of two alien races. Each of those alien races has a superpower. In fact, they have two. And there's a bit of a draft at the start of the game, but every game is going to play out differently because of the combination of those powers. So if you've got the scavengers and you've got the architects or whatever, then you've got these two powers that are going to change the way that the game plays for you. But it is a 4X game. There isn't that much exploration, to be fair. Okay, so maybe it's a 3X game, but it has all of the classic stuff. You are uh, developing things, you are playing cards to build stuff, uh, improve your technologies. There's definitely combat in the game. The combat is dice driven, but it, it has a quite a clever system using like combat levels and things like that. Um, but yeah, it was a really solid game. Now, when we played it on the Thursday night, we were done and dusted in about two and a half hours. So I actually think you could probably get a three player game of this done in two hours. Unfortunately for us, the live playthrough that we did on the channel was I think it was about three and a quarter hours long or something like that. So I hope people don't get put off by the fact that it was quite a long video, but we were talking about our choices. We were talking about our decisions. We were explaining to the people watching how to play the game. Uh, and we all talked about it afterwards. And we said, yeah, this is like a two, two and a half hour game max. Um, and it, yeah, yeah, really interesting. So definitely want to play that again. In fact, a number of my supporters who watched the video have already booked a game of it in for GridCon this year. Uh, and if I can get hold of the five to six player expansion before then, let's have a six player game of this at GridCon. It'll be fantastic. So that is the warp. Next up, Great Western Trail, New Zealand, the final one in the trilogy. Um, and I was very keen to see what this is like because Great Western Trail used to be a top 10 game for me. It dropped out of the top 10, not because I stopped enjoying it, just because Maracaibo came along and that kind of knocked it out of the top 10. Ultimately, there's only 10 games in my top 10 and it's a really, really challenge. It's a real challenge to get into my top 10. It's in my top 20. So Great Western Trail is still a 9, 9.5 out of 10 game for me. I was a little disappointed by Argentina. I have played it a couple of times, but I found it, there was a couple of bits about it that I just wasn't too keen on. And there were some graphic design issues with the game, which really got in the way of learning the game and understanding it. New Zealand might be my favourite one. Now, I'm going to caveat that by saying I've not played Rails to the North. I've still not played Rails to the North, either first edition or second edition. But Great Western Trail New Zealand, I mean, I love Great Western Trail. This was not a sponsored video, so I can say what I want about it and hopefully you'll believe me. Um... Great Western Trail New Zealand has a lot more going on. It is a more complex game than the base game of Great Western Trail. I would strongly recommend not playing Great Western Trail New Zealand as your first Great Western Trail game. I'd start with the base game first and then move on to New Zealand if you're interested after two or three games. First of all, the, the differences. There are a number of differences in it. The big differences are uh, sheep instead of cows. That's it. It's exactly the same game, but they've changed the artwork. From No, I'm kidding. Um, the sheep have a wool value. So normal Great Western Trail, you are collecting this herd of cows 
and you are cycling through the cards in your deck and what you're trying to do is you're trying to build the best set of cows for when you arrive at Kansas in order to sell those cows for money. That's what you're trying to do. But there's very little opportunity. Well, OK, there's a bit. But the only way really to make the money is to get to the end of the trail, sell the cows, make the money, make a delivery, start again. In New Zealand, you have a way of shearing your sheep at various points while you are on the trail towards Wellington. And some of the sheep have, they have a breeding value and they have a wool value. So there's two ways of accomplishing the same thing, which is get rid of cards to gain money and place a disc. It's either getting to the, getting to the end of the trail and delivering them using the normal rules or shearing them. So there's a whole other mechanism for shearing, which allows you to use your things for that. But also one thing that I really liked about it is there is more deck building opportunities because there are eight cards. Yeah. There are eight piles of cards set to one side at the start of the game. Four of them are fixed in every game, but then there are four other ones chosen at random from a set of 10. So it reminded me a little bit like Dominion, where you here's 25 different cards, choose 10 of them, and they're the ones in this game. In this one, it was, here's 10 piles of cards, choose four of them, they are your four for this game. But in addition to the four basic ones and everything else, Basically, there is a huge amount more deck building in this game because you've got all of these extra cards that you can add in. But a lot of these cards are play them on your turn, get the bonus, draw a replacement. So they're not taking up really a slot of a card in your hand. They are replacing themselves immediately when you play them. Anyway, loved the game, really enjoyed it. Probably prefer it to Great Western Trail. But as I say, it is heavier. It is more complicated. There is a lot more going on. There is a three player playthrough of that on the channel if you're interested from last week. Then in the same week, so this is going back to last Friday, I played a new game called Star Trek Discovery Black Alert. Now, this is a game coming out uh, sometime in September, maybe the start of October from WizKids who have the license to create board games based on the Star Trek IP. And this is the latest one. Now, WizKids are an existing client of mine. They have created a number of Star Trek themed games over the years. Some of them have actually been really good. Some of them not so good. So I'm always a little bit skeptical going into one of these games as to whether I'm going to enjoy it or not. Now, WizKids are a long time client of mine. I've got a very good working relationship with them. I like Star Trek. So when they asked me to cover this game, I said yes without knowing that much about it. Now, the danger for me is that I end up really not enjoying the game at all. Now, I would still cover it because, as I say, they're a client and it is a paid piece of work and they wanted me to help promote the game. As it was, and again, personal opinions, the game was great. Really, really good. And it surprised me how good it was because I was not expecting it to be that good going into it. So this is, and, and the other thing that I want to say about this game is the way that things work in the board game industry is very often a designer or designers will pitch a game to a publisher and the publisher, if that publisher has a number of licensed IPs, it is quite common for the publisher to say, well, we like your game mechanically, but we'd like to retheme it into Barbie because, you know, we, we have we have the license to create a Barbie board game and you've just pitched us this game. And if we retheme it to Barbie, we're going to sell a million copies. And the designer sat there going, oh. WizKids are one of those publishers who I'm sure would do this because they have the Dungeons and Dragons IP, they have the Star Trek IP, so I'm pretty sure they do this. So I reached out to my contact at WizKids and I asked the question. I said, look, you don't have to tell me this because this is kind of inside information, but be honest with me. Did the designers have a game, pitched it to you, and you went, yeah, we like the game, but we're going to retheme it into Star Trek? And they went, no. The designers actually designed this game specifically, and not just for Star Trek, 
but this is for Star Trek Discovery. And we went, well, hang on a minute. Yeah, we've got the license to print Star Trek board games. You've designed a Star Trek board game. Off we go. So that, when I found that out, that made me really happy. The fact that, and, and the game, the, the game, by the way, is if you know Star Trek Discovery Season 1, this game is about the spore drive. So the USS, just, just, the USS Discovery has found itself in the mirror universe and is trying to, and is using the spore drive to escape the Terran Empire. Um, the Terran Empire are trying to capture Discovery in order to exploit the spore drive technology and use it for its own nefarious means. Uh, and the Discovery is trying to complete these missions and get back to the Prime Universe. That is basically from Star Trek Discovery Season 1. That's kind of what it was. Um, and the designers created a game based on that. Went to WizKids and WizKids went, yeah, and that's it. You know, there was no re-theme of this game at all. Um, mechanically, it works really well. It is a team game. It's 2v2. Um, and it's, it's asymmetric because the USS Discovery can manipulate the mycelial network uh, and it can rotate these tiles and it can move around and it's stuff like this. Um, and yeah, he's trying to do these missions. The um, the ISS Charon is hunting it down, trying to beam aboard, trying to infiltrate it. Our game had everything. We actually played two games that day. We did one game in the afternoon, which was a learning game. And then after the learning game, I did have a couple of questions, which I put to the designers. I got answers to them. And then we did a game in the evening. Our two games could not have gone any different. And it's a shame in a way that we didn't actually live stream both of them. Now, I couldn't have live streamed the afternoon one. Uh, Patreon supporters had access to it. But again, it was very rough. It's not a game. It's not a video that I'd be comfortable having on the channel because we were... Uh, we were learning the game and we were struggling to understand how certain parts worked. The normal experience when four people sit down and play a game for the first time. But the second video, I, th I think, was a good video. We explained the rules correctly, even though I got a big one wrong right at the start. The designers corrected me and we, we fixed that. Um, but the game in the afternoon was such a different game than the one in the evening. That's what I want to say. If you watched that video and you went, ah, wasn't keen on the way it ended, then that was just an odd occurrence for that game. I won't spoil things too much. But yeah, if you're interested in that, Star Trek Discovery Black Alert, uh, it's on the channel now if you want to watch it, and the game is coming out in a couple of months' time. It didn't take us all night for that game. So I went downstairs, and there were three of us, and I had to find a game that we could play in about an hour or so. Now, there is a game which is coming out at Essen, which I've been sent a copy of in advance by uh, Chili Fox Games, which is Footprints. Now, I'm going to be covering Footprints on the channel. I have a date booked in for it after Essen because I didn't think I was going to be able to cover it before Essen. However, I am now going to try and cover it before Essen because I've now played it, which means I've learned it, and I now know that this is a relatively short game that is relatively simple to teach. Based on the fact that I know that and I already know how to play the game, I'm going to try and get it covered before Essen um, because I know a lot of people are going to be wanting to potentially pick up this title at Essen. Um, now, Chili Fox is basically the same people who do A Porter Games. And A Porter Games and Chili Fox have done some really good games over the last few years. They've done The Magnificent. They've done Revive. They did Come Together last year. They've done Capital Lux. Pretty sure that was them. Um... Yeah, they've done lots of good games over the years. Their rule books are always really good. The games are always really interesting. So I definitely had an interest in this one. And we played it. And yeah, it, it, it works really well. Um, the game's called Footprints because you are all sort of uh, prehistoric uh, cavemen, I think. And basically you are trying to move along this long, thin board. And it is you've got 14 turns to do it in. You've got this deck of cards and you have access to four cards at any one time, and you use one of those cards, discard it, and then draw a replacement. And essentially, each card gives you the option to improve something on your player board or move on the map. But when you move on the map, you move a number of spaces, depending on the terrain, and how much you've improved your player board. So it's that old dilemma of, huh, do I move on the map to get that bonus, but I'm only moving two, or 
Do I spend this turn improving something on my player board so that when I do move on the map, I get to move more? Um, and it's that balance of getting those things right. But there's a lot more going on in the game. Uh, did enjoy it and definitely going to try and get it covered before Essen. Um, finally, Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle-earth. Our campaign continues. We've had a bit of a break. Uh, for various reasons. Uh, Mark and Sally have been away, then we were busy getting married and all sorts of other things. But Sunday just gone, we continued our Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle-earth campaign. I won't talk too much about this other than I did not enjoy that scenario. That scenario that we played was very weak. Now we're playing on adventure mode because we wanted it a bit easier. The problem is, and a couple of people have actually said this to me, is they've said don't play on adventure mode, it's way too easy. We are playing an adventure mode, but we are now not getting the plus one free inspiration that the app tells you to do at the start of each shadow phase. So we've got the app set to adventure mode, but we're not getting that particular bonus. I assume it is still doing other, other stuff in the background, but this scenario, it was just a weak scenario. All we did was explore the map, uh, explore things, do some tests, get some bonuses, Every monster that turned up, and there wasn't many, we just killed. One shot. Um, yeah, I think our characters are they're just a bit too good now. And even when the big hill troll appeared... No, it was, it was the Moog Hill. That was it. A big oliphant appeared. And it's like, oh, he's got three armour and ten hit points. And Mark just went, yeah, I'm going to attack it. Do this, do that. Add a success. Do this. Right, I've done Pierce. I've done this. I've done this. Yeah, seven hits with lethal and Pierce. I was dead. So every monster that appeared on the board was dead within a turn. So it was a, it was a bit of an underwhelming session. I mean, it's, it's nice to play the game and it's nice to get together. But yeah, wasn't keen on that scenario. Um, we are two scenarios away from the end of the first campaign. So overall, we've enjoyed it. Uh, some of them we've really enjoyed. That scenario was just a bit of a weak one. And that's it. That's all of the games that I've played so far. Uh, as I say, this video is probably going to go out on Thursday of this week by which point I will have played Aeon Trespass Odyssey tonight, and I will also have played uh, Dragons Down tomorrow night, but I'll talk about them in the next video log. In terms of online gaming, I've actually slowed down quite a bit. So going back a couple of months, I was probably playing about 20 different, or 20 online games in a month. This month, I have one recorded, no, two, two recorded finished online games. And that is one game of Terraforming Mars using the Hero app website, which which I won, but was a fantastic game. And I'm not saying it's a fantastic game because I won. It's a fantastic game because I love Terraforming Mars. And in every game I play of Terraforming Mars is different. And in this one, due to the combination of the um, company that I chose, corporation that I chose, and the cards that I got, and the direction that I chose to go in, ended up being a very different game. We played with all of the expansions except for Turmoil. I'm still not sure about Turmoil. Um, but yeah, that was a great game. So thank you to those people who played that with me. Uh, and I also had one game of Castles of Burgundy uh, online, just the base game. Um, but I played that and uh, yeah, again, all, always good to play Castles of Burgundy. So yeah, I only played two games online in the last month. Uh, and I'm not going to start any, uh, any games at the moment. So yeah, just having a little bit of a hiatus from that. Other content that's been on the channel in the last month, I mentioned the how to play video for Voidfall, so that's on the channel now, and I will mention at this point that I am running a contest. So I my, my copy of Voidfall that I used to film the video with, I am giving away. So if you are interested in winning a copy of Voidfall, then all you need to do is enter the contest, uh, and the answers to that contest are in the how to play video. So yeah, if you're interested, and if you're not interested, share this link with your friends. Share this link with your gaming groups and say, look, this random guy who you've never heard of is giving away a copy of Voidfall. Go and enter it. So spread the word. Please spread the word. Tell everybody you know about it. And the reason why I'm saying that is all of the advertising revenue from that video goes to charity. So the more views that video gets, the more money gets raised for charity. Um, so yeah, spread the word about the contest. The how to play video is on the channel now. I also did a couple of unboxing videos and I did a live Q&A as well. So that was the other content that was on the channel. Coming up, so September is going to be a bit of a lighter month for reasons that I'll talk about in a minute. 
Um, but what's going on in September? There will be more Aeon Trespass Odyssey. So again, they will be Patreon exclusive streams. Those videos will never be made public. So if you are a Patreon supporter of mine, you will get sent a link telling you when those videos are happening. Uh, on the 17th of September, I'm hosting a games day round at my house um, where I will definitely be playing Nucleum from Board and Dice probably once, well, definitely once, probably twice. And then maybe some other games uh, done as well. That will be uh, a another day where I will be live streaming all of the games that I'm playing. But again, they will be Patreon exclusive only because it's basically a fly on the wall while Paul's got friends around and he's playing games with his friends. Again, those those videos are not really suitable for the public channel, um, but they're fine to do as Patreon exclusive uh, videos. So that's happening on the 17th. And the reason why I'm having people around on the 17th is because on that Friday, which will be the 22nd of September, I'm going to be doing a live tutorial and playthrough of Nucleum. This is Borden Dice's new big heavy Euro game designed by Simone Luciani and David Turtsey. And it's coming out at Essen. So it's not actually out yet, but I have a prototype right here. Um, and I'm going to be learning that on the 17th. And then I'm going to be covering it on the channel on the 22nd. So watch this space for that. Also, in the at the end of September, I've got two other sponsored videos coming. One of them is the new version of Zhang Guo. Um, which Hachette Games have sorted out uh, getting me a copy of, which I think is also going to be out at Essen, and a copy of Jin, uh, D-J-I-N-N, -N, Jin, if that's how you pronounce it. This is from um, Hall Games, and it's from the designer of Crown of Amara. I'm a big fan of Hall Games. I'm a big fan of Crown of Amara. So this was a no-brainer to cover that one. I will also try and cover Footprints, like I mentioned, and if I can get any more pre-Essen games in, I will. Then there's Essen. But Essen is actually the start of October. So there will be another monthly video log before Essen. Right, personal news. I got married. So on the 4th of August, 2023, me and Vicky got married. Um, I'm going to show some photos on screen uh, while, while I'm talking about this. These are just some of the photos that were taken. The, uh, the photographer, Andy... Uh, fantastic photographer, really, really uh, like Andy. He was actually the photographer at Vicky's sister's wedding a couple of years ago, and we 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 just thought he was he was really personable. He was really really nice. The photos were fantastic. So as soon as me and Vicky decided to get married ourselves, we called Andy and we said, "Will you be the photographer for our wedding?" Um, if you're getting married at any point in the next few years and you're interested in getting Andy to do your wedding photos, let me know because I, I can uh, I can I can send you his links. He was really, really good. Um, so, yeah, the weather thankfully held off. Now, that week was torrential rain. We had literally 24 hours a day rain Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then it cleared on Thursday afternoon. And for our wedding day, it stayed dry. It was overcast most of the day, which is perfect for the photographer, um, but it didn't rain. So we did have our outside wedding as we wanted. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's so much to say about the day that I, I, yeah, I can't, I can't summarize it. Ultimately, it was a day where most things went to plan and anything that didn't quite go to plan was only minor. Overall, we had a great day. We had a string quartet that we'd specifically chosen and we'd specifically given them a set list uh, of all of the music that we wanted them to play so they were playing through the through the um the wedding breakfast we had we had everything from um <laughs> bon jovi to the theme tune to ghostbusters um theme tune from lord of the rings all all sorts of different music being played it was just it was just fantastic uh the food was amazing but again we'd, we'd specifically put a lot of effort into picking a particular caterer. Um, the entertainment in the evening, the Kaylee, uh, the Kaylee band were, were great. Um, although my knees clearly couldn't take the amount of uh, impact on them. And I was, I was really struggling with that, but yeah, it was, it was a great day, really, really good day. And a big thank you to everybody who helped out, everybody who made that day what it was. Now, one thing that I do want to mention about the wedding is that we specifically said to people that we don't want gifts. We've been living together for 18 years. We don't need anything, although the toaster broke the day before we got married. 
So we do need a new toaster. Um, but apart from that, we, we don't need anything. And what we didn't want is we didn't want people to just get us more stuff. We already have too much stuff in the house uh, and it's really starting to bother us. So we don't want any more stuff. We want to get people to give money for charity. As as you know, if you're a regular viewer of, my, a regular viewer of mine, I donate all of my advertising revenue to charity. So we make, we, we donate about £8,000 a year to charity. Uh, just ourselves and we do the charity raffle at gridcon which last year raised four and a half thousand pounds so we donate a huge amount of money to charity every year and what we wanted what would make us happy is rather than people get us presents is people make a donation to charity now in secret without us knowing about it my sneaky patreon supporters um organized two charity fundraisers one for the Cats Protection Agency, which is where we got Thor and Loki from, and another one for the Chris Lith Youth Empowerment Network, which is a charity that we've supported for years. Um, the money raised from them, thank you so much. Uh, I cannot thank you enough um, for for contributing to that. Some some individuals were we were bowled over by the generosity of of some individuals that that donated a huge amount of money so yeah a big thank you to all of you for doing that but it was only a relatively small number of people who did actually donate to that so what i'm going to do is i'm actually going to put links to those two uh, donations in the description of this video and if you're watching this video and whether you're a patron supporter or you're not a patron supporter if you would like to donate just a pound or two pounds or five pounds or whatever to one of those two charities uh, as a way of saying congratulations to Paul and Vicky for getting married. You don't have to, no obligation whatsoever, but if you wanted to, there are links in the description of this video. So it's the Cats Protection Agency and the Chrysalis Youth Empowerment Network. Go ahead, feel feel free if you just want to make a donation to us. Uh, you know, we'd really appreciate it, even though we're not obviously getting anything out of it because that's what that's what we wanted from our wedding to raise some money for charity. So yeah, huge thank you for that. Now, the other thing that I wanted to mention uh, about is, and I'm not gonna go into too much details here, but uh, this video is probably one of the last videos which is gonna be uh, on the channel, board game content wise for the next couple of weeks. I'm taking a break from creating uh, board game content for the next two weeks. So don't expect any new videos for board games to appear on the channel. I should have my top 10 games of 2022 going live tomorrow, um, if I manage to get that done in time. If I don't, I'll do it soon. But other than that, the channel is going on a break for two weeks. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't gonna be any content. What it means is there's not gonna be any board game content and there's not gonna be any live streams. However, I have recently picked up a new computer game called Book of Hours, and I've been playing it quite a bit. I'm really, really enjoying it. So what I've been doing is I have been recording various playthroughs of me playing the game, and I am going to be releasing them gradually every two or three days uh, over the next two weeks. So there will be some content on the channel, but it will only be playthroughs for a particular computer game. So if you're if you're a regular viewer of the channel and you think, wait a minute, where's Paul gone? What's he doing? Why is he now just playing computer games? Please don't unsubscribe or block me or anything like that. It is just that I am taking a two week break from creating board game content. But I didn't want there to be no content on the channel at all. And I've got this new computer game that I'm really enjoying playing. So don't feel you have to watch it at all. It's there if you want to. Um, but that way... I get to play a computer game that I like. I get to create some different type of content for the channel, which I enjoy creating. And it means there is something there on the channel whilst I'm not doing anything uh, else content wise for the next two weeks. I'll explain more on the 15th, 16th of uh, September. Uh, but other than that, that's, that's everything. So I think I've talked about all of the games that I've been playing, what's coming up, talked about the wedding, yeah. That's, that's everything. Except that's not everything. One of the things that I do in each of these video logs is I give you a little bit of a Patreon update. So as always, I wanted to say a huge thank you 
uh, to all of you that support me on Patreon and help keep the channel going, uh, funding videos like this, but also a lot of the other stuff that I do in the background as well. Uh, and every month I put a list on screen of all of the new supporters that have joined in that month. So on screen right now is a list of all of the new supporters that have joined in August, although I am recording this audio on the 30th of August at about two o'clock in the afternoon. So if anybody does join between now and the end of the month, uh, then yeah, they're, they're not gonna appear on this list. Um, but yeah, a big thank you to all of my new supporters. Now, every month there is a gradual turnover. As I mentioned, a lot of people leave, a lot of new supporters join. I think this month has actually been a net loss in terms of number of supporters, but you know, the patron support is still exceptionally high and I'm still very, very happy with it. All I will say is every single month, uh, and Patreon have admitted this, there's actually been a problem with the Patreon system that they've admitted to, to me personally, a couple of weeks ago, uh, that due to some kind of technical glitch in their system, a lot of people's payments have not been going through. So actually the number of Patreon supporters I have might be higher than this. So if you are one of my Patreon supporters, and you are watching this video, could I just ask you to just log on to the Patreon page and just make sure that your, uh, your payment is being taken and that your account is active. You will know that your account is not active because you won't be getting any of the messages of the polls and everything else that come through. Um, but yeah, as I say, big thank you to all of you for supporting the channel uh, and helping keep things going. And if you want to support the channel directly, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash gaming rules. I'll be back next month with a roundup of everything that I did in September. And until then, take care and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.